Welcome back to our lecture series, Math 1210, Calculus 1 for students at Southern Utah University. As usual, I'll be your professor today, Dr. Andrew Misselbine. In lecture 8, we are going to start chapter 2, uh, which is about the idea of limits, for which we really are now going to start calculus. Everything we've done previously was just a review of pre-calculus materials that wax on, wax off, that uh, the Karate Kid had to go through. Now we're actually going to start applying these techniques into this setting which we call calculus. Now to motivate that we really have to start talking about the idea of a limit. And while uh, many uh, calculus textbooks and, and classes try to start motivating this with tangent lines and velocity, that does make sense. We're going to take a slightly different uh, start to our discussion of limits in this course. And we're actually going to introduce the idea of a limit using the vehicle of error and tolerance. And so to explain what one means by error and tolerance, I'm going to borrow a homework exercise actually from James Stewart's calculus textbook. As of the 8th edition, this should be exercise 2412. So imagine a crystal growth furnace is used in research to determine how best to manufacture crystals used in electronic components for the space shuttle. This does kind of date the problem a little bit. Sorry, they don't have space shuttles the way you used to, but you didn't, that's beside the point, right? For proper growth of the crystal, the temperature must be controlled accurately by adjusting the input power. Suppose the, that the relationship is given by the following, which you can see here on the screen. T of W, where T is the temperature in, of the oven, of the furnace, in Celsius. Uh, I know a chemist just tried somewhere. It should be in Kelvin, but we're going to measure it in Celsius. Uh, so the formula T of W is given as one or 0 0.1 W squared plus 2.155 W plus 20, where W right here is measuring the power input into the furnace uh, measured in watts. All right, so we have this relationship between the temperature of the furnace and the wattage of the furnace. And this is how a typical electrical oven works, that maybe we send electrical current through some type of heating element or other capacity. We don't need to do all the details of that. But basically, we insert more power when we want it to get hotter, and then we lower the power when we want it to get it cooler. Uh, this is an important thing to remember when we have a function relationship, that with a function relationship, you essentially have two variables in play. There's the variable W here, which in our situation is our input variable, right? This is the variable, sometimes it's called the direct variable, because this is the variable that we actually have direct control over. We control how much power is entering the system. On the other hand, T here is what we could call the output variable, or we could call it the indirect variable. And I really like that name there because with the indirect variable, we don't actually have control on what it is. We have control over W and then from W, this function relationship then causes T to change. Because after all variable, the word means am able to vary, right? So T will vary based upon W. We actually have control over W we don't have control over T, not direct control. So we, as the operator of this furnace, we have our direct variable W and then the indirect variable is T here. But keep that in mind as we continue on with this problem. So imagine how much power is needed to maintain the temperature at 200 degrees Celsius. Let's suppose that the engineers who work in this lab here know that 200 degrees Celsius is the optimal baking temperature for growing these crystals so that we know. But we can't just wave a wand and make the furnace turn into 200 degrees because again, we don't have direct control over the temperature. We have control over the wattage. So it's important to know the variable we have control of, how do we control it to cause the variable which we don't control but we want to influence? How do we choose the wattage to influence the temperature to the desired temperature, all right? Well, given that we have this function relationship, I'm going to put a big green box around it so we can remember it. Because we have this function relationship here, uh, if, if we want the temperature to be 200 degrees, essentially we're trying to solve the equation T of W equals 200 degrees. Now that's an equation we really can't solve by itself, but if we make the relationship, oh, T of W is this quadratic polynomial, then we have to solve the equation 0.1 W squared plus 2.15 W plus 20 equals 200. This is an algebraic equation which we potentially could solve. 
Like if we were to subtract 200 from both sides of the equation, you get 20 minus 200, which would be negative 180. We then have this quadratic equation right here in standard form, for which from a previous algebra or pre-calculus class, we then have an inkling on what to do. We could try solving it by factoring, by completing the square. Given the decimals going on here, I think probably the, the best approach is just going to be use the quadratic formula. So sing along with me. Pop goes the weasel. I'm not actually going to sing it here. But we see that based upon the formula right here, W equals negative E plus or minus the square root of B squared minus 4AC all over 2A. All right. You can do that to the tune. Pop goes the weasel, right? Now, for us, I didn't do plus or minus because notice as this number right here is negative and a, a square root is always going to be positive by definition. If I take a negative minus a negative, I'm going to get a negative wattage, which that doesn't make sense for this problem, right? This is why we often have to analyze things like domain. What are the acceptable values for my variable W? A negative wattage wouldn't make any sense in this context. So we're, we, can, we can restrict our attention just to the positive case. Now that with the quadratic formula, if we just focus on the positive side, then we know that this just becomes a number crunch at this moment. Uh, we're going to get 2.155 squared is approximately 4.64403. Um, if you take negative 4 times, well, actually, if you take 0.1 times 180, that gives you 18. 4 times 18 is going to be 72. It's a double negative, so it makes it a positive. So we get this number, 4.64403 plus 72. If you add together the terms of the radicands, you would get 76.644, etc. Take its square root. That's about 8.75466. And then subtract from that negative 2.155. We get 6.59966. Divide that point by 0.2. Because remember, the numerator was 2, point, uh, 2 times 0 0.1. So you get 0 0.2. So when you divide that out, you're going to get 32.9983, which is approximately 33 watts. All right, so by solving this algebraic problem, we see that 33 watts would be how much power we want to enter into the system to get the ideal temperature of 200 degrees. But 33 watts isn't actually the answer. This is an estimate of the answer. We round it to the nearest watt. Um, if, if this formula, remember the green box from a moment ago, if this formula is to be taken without any criticism whatsoever, like how reliable is the formula, We'll think of that as a black box or as a green box in this case. If we just accept that this formula is absolutely true, then the correct answer is not actually 33 watts. It's 32.9983. But even that answer isn't actually precise because you'll notice along the way, right, 20 or 2.155 squared, is that exactly 4.64403? I would probably guess not uh, I, I, that that was rounded, right? Uh, four times 0 0.1 times 180, that is actually 72. But the thing is, this right here was probably rounded, right? So there's some type of rounding here. You add it to 72, then take the square root. This number is rounded as well, because after all, we're in irrational numbers at this point. Um, in which case, when you add that together, that's legit. But then you divide it by 0 0.2. There's a lot of rounding that we did along the way. And then we finally round it at the very end. So with all of these rounding, we get error into the system. That is, our calculations are not exactly precise. The precise answer would be an irrational number. Again, that's not even talking about how erroneous the original model is. If the, if the model is accurate, we still are going to have some type of error. So assuming 32.9983 is pretty good, is rounding that, that 100th? Oh, you know, two one thousandths of a watt. Does that make much of a difference? Well, it's not going to be precisely 200 degrees Celsius. So one then sort of asks, well, what's allowed then? It, 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 getting exact precision, like perfect 200 degrees Celsius, that's not going to happen, right? Even if our instruments were so precise, we could get that 32.9983 watts each and every time, right? There's error in that number. It's going to fluctuate a little bit, right? Um... And so, I mean, even though 200 is the optimal temperature to grow crystals, it's very unreasonable to expect the temperature to be perfectly set at 200 degrees at all times during the growth of the crystal. Since fluctuations in environmental temperature, like the, the room, the city that this laboratory is in, um, also there's power issues from the power supply, right? That could cause marginal, maybe even microscopic defects in maintaining the temperature. So instead, we should be concerned with how close 
to 200 degrees is close enough. That is how much error is considered allowable. And so let's say that our researchers have come to the conclusions through their data that plus or minus one degree Celsius is an allowable amount of error. That is, as long as it doesn't get above one degree or below one degree from 200 degrees, then the, cre or then the crystals will grow in an optimal temperature. So if the temperature is allowed to vary from 200 degrees Celsius by up to plus or minus one degree Celsius, what range of wattage is allowed for the input value? Well, if we go one degree above 200, that's 200 plus one, so that's 201. Um, if we go one degree below 200 degrees, that'll be 200 minus one, which is 199 degrees. So this right here is the allowable fluctuation in the temperature. So this gives us an interval of temperatures. So our temperature can range from 199 to 201. So this is considered acceptable. Okay, this is allowable. But how do we get these exact numbers? Well, if you take the function from the previous slide, you know, the 0.1 W squared plus 2155 W plus 20, that's T of W here. We have to solve that equation again, set T of W equal to 199. You subtract 199 from both sides, put in the quadratic formula. If you approximate your answer, you'll get approximately 32.8839, which remember the, the ideal temperature excuse me, the ideal wattage we did on the previous slide was 32.9983 watts, right? That was that was the ideal, the optimal one. So if we, if we allow ourselves to go down to 199 degrees, then we can allow the wattage to go down to 32.8839. Um, on the other hand, if we wanna figure out how high can we get in terms of wattage, well, T of W, if you set that equal to 201 and solve the resulting quadratic equation, I won't go through the details of this, you'll get approximately 33.1124. Um, and so this then gives you another interval. So in terms of the temperature, the temperature is allowed to fluctuate between 199 degrees and 201 degrees, which means that the wattage is allowed to fluctuate from 32.8839 watts up to 33.1124 watts. So telling the telling the operator to keep it at 33 watts would be an allowable uh, power level to maintain this level of this level of temperature. And so this example is really motivating uh, this idea that we're trying to build towards with the idea of a limit. So when working with these functions, we can control the range of the output by controlling the domain of the input, right? We didn't have direct control on the temperature, but we did have direct control on the wattage, right? When you go home and bake cookies, right? You don't actually control the temperature. You control, assuming you have a conventional electric oven, you have control over the power, right? When you turn the knob, that doesn't make the temperature increase, that makes the power increase, which then has a consequence of changing the temperature, right? And so well, from what we saw from this example here, if the if we put the watts, W, in the interval 32.8 to 33.11, that will guarantee that the temperature is between 199 and 201, all right? And so this, this is what we're, we mean by error. And so now we're officially in a place where we can define what that means. Let the Greek letter epsilon denote our numerical error tolerance. The Greek letter epsilon, which kind of looks like an E, um, is sort of like the Greek equivalent of E, E for error here. And so what is our error tolerance? It's the marginal amount of actual output, which is acceptable from the desired one, right? So when it came to, when it came to the, uh, the example with the furnace, our desired output, which we call L, L is actually short for limit here. We'll talk about that in the next video. L was 200 degrees. All right, but then we discovered that the error was allowed to be one degree Celsius. Okay, and so it's important to, to it's important to know when you talk about error, you can't have negative error. error negative error doesn't make any sense. Um, also, you can't let you can't put error to be zero because zero error will mean perfection. For which, although that would be ideal, that's not practical. We anticipate error in the system, so we're not going to allow negative or zero error. So oftentimes in context of limits, people often say things like, let epsilon be greater than zero. We're saying that we have some, you know, some specific positive value for error, although in proofs, we like to keep this generic. For the setting of the exercise we just did, the error was specifically one. That was the allowed um, error in that example. 
And so if you then allow yourself to vary, we took 200 minus one and we took 200 plus one. We took that interval that gave us the interval of 199 and 201. If we do that generically, we're gonna take our desired output minus the error as the lower bound. And then we're gonna take our desired output L plus the error. And this then this interval gives us the so-called margin of error. This is the interval for which we can fluctuate our indirect variable or output variable, and that would be considered acceptable. Okay, there's so the margin of error is this allowable fluctuations. And you know, as, as students, as many of you watching this video are probably students, another good example of error, um, take your typical calculus student, say in a class like this one. Um, this, of course, uh, you know, students typically want to get good grades in a calculus class, right? So if you want to get a passing grade in my calculus class, you'd have to get a uh, 73 or above. That would give you a C, above, above a C. C or better is considered a passing grade. But for some students, a passing grade's not good enough. Maybe a student wants to ace the class, right? In which case, if you want to get an A in the class, then your final average needs to be at least 93 or above. Um, and so... You know, for the C student who just wants to pass, their allowance would be 73 to 100%. But for the A student, theirs would be 93 to 100%, right? So that the A student has a much smaller margin of error in terms of their final grade. That is, they allow less error in terms of calculating their final grade here. All right, so that, that that's sort of like a funny little aside. Okay, maybe it's not that funny, but you know, it, it's relevant to the typical view right now. Uh, so continuing on with this idea of error, right? This margin of error. Um, if we have some function, right? So you see a function f right here. We have some function, which we don't have direct control on the output variable, which for the sake of argument, let's call the output variable here y. And what we do have direct control over is the input variable, call it x, for the lack of a better name right here. So let L be our target value. This is the number we want to output from the function. So for our furnace example, this was 200 degrees. Now this desired value will coincide with some, you know, some portion of the function, right? Um, if it's inside the range of the function, it should be hitting the function somewhere. But we do allow ourselves to go a little bit below L and a little bit above L by a, 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 a quantity which we call epsilon, the error, right? So we allow to go above or below L. So this little strip you see on the screen right here, this is our margin of error. As long as we're within these two horizontal lines, then we're considered acceptable. We can tolerate any fluctuation in the margin of error, okay? And so therefore, what we're looking for is this expression right here. F of X, which is the Y coordinate, so Y equals F of X. F of X, as long as it's greater than L minus epsilon, the lower bound, but less than L plus epsilon, which is the upper bound, that's considered acceptable. If F of X is between L, is if, if, if F of X is between L plus or minus epsilon, that is acceptable. Which, because of the symmetric bounds right here, uh, we can actually simplify this box in the following way. If you take the absolute value of f of x minus l, that needs to be less than epsilon. The idea is, if you take the absolute value, we don't know if you're a little bit above or a little bit below l. Um, so that way we can, get the, we can get rid of the plus and minus epsilon. We can consolidate it as a single statement. All right. So now that a margin of error is given, it is desirable to have an interval of inputs, which will guarantee that the outputs land within the margin of error. This interval of input is what we will call the domain of allowance which will be denoted by a minus delta comma a plus delta. Let me explain what those mean a little bit here. So we have L, our desired value. You have epsilon, the allowable error. And then we get this margin of error like so. Well, this, this value L is going to coincide with the function somewhere, right? So in order to hit L, like what's a perfect bullseye? What, what do we aim to hit L? Well, for this function, we're calling that number A that if I take the number A and put it into my machine, put it inside my function, it'll coincide, it'll produce the value L. And the reason we call it A in this context, think of it as like we're playing archery, we're aiming, right? Um, if we have some target over here, right? There's a bullseye that we wanna hit and we're shooting our arrow. I know that these graphics are superb, right? I should be working for Pixar, I think right now. But when you're, if you're, if you're an athlete 
in the sport of archery, if you're an archer, right, what your desired target is the bullseye. You want to hit the bullseye. Now, the bullseye is not just a single point. It's actually a circle. Anywhere in that circle is considered the full points. That's considered a bullseye. And so you then need to shoot your arrow into the bullseye. Now, you can't just, like, run up and thrust your arrow into the target, right? That's not acceptable. Um, so you can't choose where you're going to hit. What you can do is you can choose how you're going to aim, right? So the variables you would have control over as an archer is you can control the angle of inclination. You can control how far back you pull the string. Um, you can choose to shoot side to side based upon the wind. There's a couple of variables in play here, but these are the variables you have direct control over. And then where you hit, that is where you have indirect control over. That controlling a, a true, a, a good archer is one who can control the direct variables to get the indirect variable that they want. That's what we're trying to do right here. So A here stands for aim. That if we aim using the number A, a perfect aim would hit the value L perfectly over here. But again, we allow some type of error. So what fluctuation can we have on A to guarantee that will be in the margin of error? So like how far to the left of A can we go? How far to the right of A can we go? Um, and so this gives us, this blue strip gives us the domain of allowance. If we're in, if, if our input is within the domain of allowance, that'll guarantee that the output is within the margin of error. And so we want to choose delta. So how far to the left or right of A can we get? So we have our margin of error and our domain of allowance. Let's consider the previous example and make sure we label all of these parts right here. So our target value our target value, like we said earlier, was L to be 200, 200 degrees. That was the target. Our epsilon was 1. We were allowed to go 1 below or above 200. And so this then gives us our margin of error. Our margin of error sitting right here. So then the perfect value, the perfect value that hits 200 degrees, that was our number 32 0.9983. So that was the perfect value. If you hit the wattage at that value, you'll get 200 degrees precisely. And then we saw that our domain of allowance here was that if you had 32.8839 watts, you would you would hit 199 degrees. Uh, and also, if you had 33.1124, that would give you the 201 degrees. I'll just label those real quickly. 199 degrees. Now, when it comes to our picture that we have right here, you'll notice that you go the same amount above as you below. But because of a function's uh, curvature, it could be that one side is more oblong than the other. And so what we're trying to do, what, what, what the type of homework questions you'll see for this type of unit right here, is you're trying to figure out what symmetric choice of delta are you going to choose? And so what you're going to do is you're going to look for the piece on the left side, the piece on the right side. You're going to subtract it from A and then pick the smaller value. Uh, so the minimum, the minimum is going to be this value delta that we're looking for here. And so for our function, if you take the A value, 32.9983, and subtract it from the left bound, 32.8839, you get the value 0.1144. OK, if you take the bigger value, 33.1124 and subtract that from A, which is 32.9983, that'll give you 0.1141, which you'll notice that this one was a little bit smaller, 0.1141 versus 0.1144. So it turns on the left, you actually have a little bit more allowance than you do on the right. But we're always going to choose the restrictive. We have to round to the smaller one here. And so for this problem, the delta value is going to be 0.1141. And then that gives us the domain of allowance. You're going to take your A value and subtract from it and add to it delta. So 32.9983 subtract delta gives you 32.8842. You'll notice that's a little bit closer to A than we started with. And then the other one will be uh, 33.1124, which is A plus delta.